galaxy around us. A naval officer who also lost his life the year of the pressure stated it this way. Admiral Rickover wrote me a few days ago describing the ceremony of the commissioning of a new Polaris submarine, and he said that uh, to each captain of the new submarine, he gives a plaque which contains an old Breton prayer, which was said by fishermen from there for hundreds of years. And the prayer says, Oh God, the sea is so great and my boat is so small. The 129 men who perished with Thresher were the first casualties of our nuclear Navy. The search for Thresher, 8,500 feet down, and for the cause of its loss, has taken us into a dark, silent, awkward world of which we know little. CBS reports the legacy of the Thresher, reported by CBS News correspondent Dan Rather. Bridge time, this is the cap. I have the time, direct the bridge for dive. Break the bridge for dive, up the deck guys, sir. Last man down, bridge is rigged for dive, sir. Very well. Sound the dive alarm. Sound the dive alarm. Uh, Alright, got the induction? Set the induction. Very well. Six oh feet. Six oh feet, I sir. Six oh feet, five degree down. All right, sweep around and report all contact. This is the control room of the nuclear attack submarine furnace, SSN-594. It looks much like the control room of many of our nuclear-powered attack submarines. On April 10th, 1963, 220 miles east of Boston, the attack submarine Thrusher, SSN-593, was making test dives after some extensive overhaul of Portsmouth Naval Shipyards. What is happening here now is happening on that April morning, with one exception. The Thrusher never surfaced again. All of the events of that morning may never be known. Complete answers as to why they happened may never come. But more than any other single event, the loss of the Thrusher pinpointed the need of this country to know more about the deep ocean that covers three quarters of the Earth's surface. This great underwater detective story began at 9.17 the morning of April 10th, 1963, on the bridge of the USS Skylark, when Thresher and Skylark rendezvoused for the last time. Skylark is a submarine rescue vessel commanded by Lieutenant Commander Stanley Hecker. We effected a rendezvous with Thresher somewhere about 6 to 6.30 in the morning and she had been operating submerged the previous night en route to the rendezvous point for her uh, deep dive. Communications were normal. We did ask Thresher to send us a message of some sort or communicate with us by the underwater telephone at no greater than 15 minute intervals to keep us informed as to her uh, location, whereabouts, or a bearing and range from our ship. The last person to talk to Thresher was Bosun's mate second class, Roy Mowen, from the bridge of the Skylark. Approximately 9.02, uh, Thresher called us on the UQC and asked us to repeat our course and speed, and we repeated it back to her. And approximately 10 minutes later, we got a routine uh, UQC check with her. Approximately 9.12, uh, she sent us a message saying that she was experiencing minor difficulties at positive up angle attempting to blow and communications were kind of fuzzy at that time and the captain took the UQC and asked them three times if they were in control and there was no reply. This was about 9.15 in the morning, yet it was 12.30 before squadron headquarters in New London learned that Thresher was in trouble. Captain Hecker explains why. I felt that she was not in any serious trouble. I felt that if she had been in serious trouble, they'd have said something uh, quite a bit stronger to alert us. 
I then took the underwater telephone and asked them myself if they were in control. About that time, I heard what sounded like air blowing in tanks. I've heard this quite often being on submarines. That was the last actual communication we had with pressure or that I personally heard with pressure. At that point, I felt that uh, she may have had a transducer failure, but was so far along in her trials that she didn't want to abort. I felt that the next thing to do would be to use our grenade signal. We then commenced dropping the hand grenades at the required interval and the required number, which uh, is more of a, an order to the submarine to disclose your position. This, too, was unsuccessful. I felt that we had better alert our flotilla commander that we had, in fact, lost communications with Thresher, conducting expanding search. Thresher was part of a squadron of five attack submarines based in New London under the command of Captain Frank Andrews. Did you believe at this point that Thresher was in trouble? We had dive messages that were overdue before, and inevitably it's been a communication breakdown. And so the first reaction was, well, this is a communication breakdown, and it'll only be a matter of an hour or two hours, and we'll hear all about it. The Skylark and another rescue vessel, the Recovery, stayed on the scene. And at 5 o'clock that afternoon, sighted the dreaded oil slick. Although Thrusher was nuclear-powered, she carried diesel oil auxiliary engines. We recovered some samples and uh, checked the possible radiation from these samples. We felt, of course, that there would be no real problem with this because of the seawater being such an excellent shield. And uh, reported in a situation report that we had sighted the oil slick, in fact, that we were in the oil slick and were recovering these particles off court. At 7 o'clock the night of the first day, off-duty submarine commanders started the agonizing ordeal of notifying next of kin in New London and Portsmouth. At 9 p.m., Admiral George Anderson, then Chief of Naval Operations, speaking from the Pentagon, told the nation. Uh, to those of us who have been brought up in the traditions of the sea, one of the saddest uh, occasions is when we lose a ship. Such was the case today when it appears that the nuclear-powered submarine Thresher was lost with 129 officers, men, and civilians. On the morning of the second day, the search pattern for Thresher was established. In Navy parlance, ground zero is called datum, the arbitrary starting point for the search. By this time, Admiral Ramage had come to scene. This had been a Thursday morning as the flag officer in charge. And he had established the datum about which the search was to be conducted. A datum was chosen as a point where Skylark was when Skylark last heard from Thresha. Submariners seldom got to bury their dead. And in New London, San Diego, Holy Lock, Honolulu, and all the other closely knit submarine bases around the world, memorial services were held. At Portsmouth, where Thresher was built and overhauled just before her death, there was an outdoor prayer at a submarine shrine, the ancient U-boat Squakes lost in shallow water off Portsmouth 25 years ago, with 26 lost. Squalus was recovered and lived to fight in World War II. Now her bridge and superstructure provided an historic background for those who mourned Thresher. A naval court of inquiry, which would meet in secret for three months, was already in session. Its president, Vice Admiral Bernard Austin, a veteran submariner and head of the War College at Newport, had served on similar courts before, but never one so much in the headlines. Then the whole character of the search changed into uh, more or less of an oceanographic expedition. And for very good reason, there was no real search capability in the Navy at that time to go into an area such as the area off of Cape Cod and to search for a submarine which was bottomed at 8,400 feet. There simply was none. Ever since the S-4 went down off Cape Cod in 1927, the Navy has been developing an underwater salvage capability, and the dramatic rescue of Squalus in 1939, with 33 members of its crew still alive, was one of the results. Today, the depth limit of submarine salvage extends only to 800 feet, even though our modern nuclear submarines are assumed to go much deeper. 
Anything beyond that depth is as foreign to them as the outer atmosphere is to propeller-driven airplanes. There was no known search technique at those depths. There were no known search techniques. There was no team developed to uh, follow up on any search technique. It simply didn't exist. So therefore, in order to go on and try to solve the problem, which was to locate the hull, if possible, we had to turn to the only people in this country that know anything about this sort of problem, namely the oceanographers. On the Pacific coast, the three-man deep-diving bathyscap Trieste, an oceanographic submersible which holds the world's deep-diving record, 35,000 feet, was ordered from its San Diego base to join the search. This is Trieste Commander Donald Keach, who would play a dominant role in the search for Thresher. And I was called uh, from Washington and told the circumstances and asked if the Trieste uh, could handle the job. And it uh, took us about two weeks total time to get it ready and get it chipped out for the East Coast by way of an LSD. Uh, transported it around in about 12 days, uh, almost a record time for this type of ship. The first oceanographic vessel at the scene was the Atlantis II from Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Senior scientist, Dr. Brockett Hersey, tells of the first solid clue. After reaching the scene, which took a very short time, one of the very first things that was done was to uh, take uh, many water samples looking for any possible traces of radioactivity. We were assigned to uh, make a detailed uh, echo sounding survey of a five mile square, which uh, included the last known position of the thresher. Now, uh, in many places, the bottom was so rough that had the thresher been there, we wouldn't have had a chance of doing anything. Our detailed survey of the bottom had not progressed very far before we uh, did find smooth places. Uh, and in one of them, we did find a bump on the bottom of a bullet the right size to be the thresher. And consequently, was was classified by the Navy as a possible thresher location and was given the name Contact Delta. Uh, when we had finished this uh, detailed echo sounding, had found Contact Delta and actually two or three other possibilities, uh, we realized that we had to return to Woods Hole. We had no cameras with us for one thing and uh, we just needed a variety of other equipment. So uh, after two or three days uh, in Woods Hole, we came back in the middle of a very heavy storm, which, uh, which condition was quite characteristic of the first, uh, oh, nearly month of the searching operations. And it took us some three or four days to find this bump again. But we did find it. And we did attempt to uh, tow a camera roughly 15 to 20 feet above the bottom, over this bump. This is where the, our troubles began, because uh, if you imagine the situation of the ship, which is itself only 200 feet long, at the surface of the sea, roughly a mile and a half above the place where the submarine might be, and dangling a camera on a cable which might be 8,500 to 9,000 feet long, it's quite obvious, you simply won't know what that cable is doing down below the ship. You can do the best that you can by knowing immediately where the camera is. And we had a very aggressive plotting party on the ship that computed from these acoustic arrival times where that camera was. These uh, individual photographs are made so that they overlap to form a mosaic. This particular uh, set here represents a strip about 150 feet long and maybe 15 or 20 feet wide uh, in the center of the very first debris that was found. You can, uh, you can see here individual bits. This is, a, this is a piece of crumpled sheet metal, apparently a piece of paper, other pieces of paper, many bits of of crumpled metal, uh, frayed ends of, of uh, electrical cable, and uh, similar pieces of debris. But there was nothing here that definitively was said to have come from pressure. That is correct. 
On none of the pieces of paper could we truly identify the, the name. None of these things said Thresher on them. So they were just another circumstantial lead, so to speak. But uh, they were promising enough so that the Navy and other uh, laboratory groups which cooperated in the search uh, concentrated on this area. To pursue these first clues, the naval research vessel Gillis joined the search armada. Its senior scientist, Chester Buchanan. Well, the main problem is navigation and weather. Uh, this is not a very uh, congenial part of the ocean. It's rough up here most of the year, and uh, there's a lot of fog. And we're operating now in a two-by-two -two area with two ships. Uh, last week, we had three ships in this same area. Now, many times, we couldn't even see the other ship. Of course, we can see them on the radar. The uh, second problem is navigation. The current down deep in the ocean appears predominantly to be northeast. However, the current at the surface of the ocean is circulatory and varies with the tide. Now, in addition, we have wind. Now, you put these three things together, and uh, we have a very fine guessing game on which way you uh, can actually move and where your equipment will be relative to your ship when it's on this 9,000-foot string hanging below us. When the search first started, the area was a 10 by 10 mile area. That's 100 square miles. There were 10 ships in the area at that time, and these 10 ships made a very good bottom contour map of this area using PDR's precision depth recorder to determine uh, the bottom contours and see if it would be possible to locate the pressure in that contour. After that, we loaded the television camera and bottom picture-taking cameras and stereo aboard, and we've just finished a camera run today. We have facilities aboard for developing these pictures, and we have taken uh, thousands of photographs of the bottom, many of which have debris. By this means, we hope to determine what part of the area had debris in it, and then perhaps to deduce which direction the uh, pressure might lie. Navigation was also a problem for another oceanographic vessel, the Conrad from Columbia's Lamont Laboratory. Senior scientist, Dr. Joseph Warzel. In one instance, for instance, it took us two days to get to the place that we had been trying to get to for those two days. We decided that it was necessary to have better navigation. We prepared ourselves to set some uh, rather large taut line moored buoys. Uh, these are buoys with anchors and the line under great strain uh, so that the buoys will not wander laterally very much. And uh, they have on them a uh, light so that we can find them easily at night and a radar transponder uh, and uh, transmits its own radar signal back so that you get a good uh, answer from the buoy uh, from uh, even great distance and even in rough weather. In our early days out here, one of the uh, uh, things that we did were to take uh, cores of the bottom to see how stiff the bottom was and so that people uh, who understood these things could make estimates of how far the submarine might have sunk into the sediment. In addition to this, uh, we have made uh, magnetometer surveys. With this device, we had hoped to get an indication of the submarine. So far, uh, we have had only one successful run with it. Uh, in all other cases, we have had troubles from either pressure or temperature or leaks in the pressure case at these very great depths. Uh, it might be of interest to know that the pressure down here is about 4,000 pounds per square inch. We decided that the most effective means would be to try to thoroughly saturate the area in which the debris had been found with underwater photographs in the hope that it would lead us to a uh, uh, concentration of debris that would indicate the direction to the thresher. Uh, we did this and we made the tracks that we see here. Uh, this is north up here. Well, this is the area in which we have searched. This shows our attempt to run a straight line has uh, become curved. Uh, in some cases, we have tried to turn around deliberately. These are the tracks on which, all, all of the tracks on which we have taken approximately 1,500 photographs in the last week or 10 days. Watching this collection of marine geologists, physicists, photographers, sonar experts, and submariners who had never worked together on such a project, 
attempting something never attempted at such awesome depths, grappling for something that might no longer exist, one is overwhelmed with the complexities of the task. And when one remembers that a mile and a half down, the pressure is so great that a submarine's massive steel hull would be crumpled like a piece of paper, smashed like a tin can under a drop hammer, one asks how anything can live under such pressure. But the fact is that animal life does exist down there. Dr. Roger Revell, one of the world's leading oceanographers and director of the Scripps Institute, explains this mystery. Well, a fish does it by not having any air inside it. He's, a, he's, a, he's essentially water. Uh, although he's, of course, got some other chemicals to make up his body besides water. But, but uh, fish living in very deep water have, have a, a the, the pressure is, 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 is uniform on their inside of their bodies as well as on the outside. So that, that in fact, they're, they're, they're essentially insensitive to it. It is true that fish at mid-depth have what are called swim bladders. They have a bladder, a, a, a little balloon of gas in, uh, inside their bodies, and they expand and contract this balloon of gas. That, in other words, they shift ballast, just like a submarine does, to go down or to come up. Whales apparently go down as much as 3,000 feet, and uh, what they do is simply coll uh, their, 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 their lungs become very uh, shrink in size until the pressure of the air in their lungs is equal to the pressure of the water outside. So that again, the pressure is uniform on the inside and the outside. After two months of an intensive, frustrating search, Thresher's remains still had not been located. Scientists and submariners differed on how to proceed. The Navy officer in charge at the scene, Captain Frank Andrews, favored dragging the bottom. So I was for that, and everybody else was against it. And they were against it because they kept thinking of the uh, philosophy of the uh, aviators. When they have a plane crack, they don't want to disturb anything about the terrain because they want to be able to reconstruct the entire accident. The outcome of the argument was that we didn't solve it up at Woods Hole around the conference table. We decided to go down to Norfolk, Virginia and present the two sides to Admiral Grenfell and see what he thought. I had been washed on Sunday afternoon en route to Norfolk and was paged at the Washington airport by my friend and classmate, Captain Charlie Bishop, who was my opponent in this argument. And he said, uh, Frank, there's no need for us to go to Norfolk. I was real excited. And uh, first thing we could do is call up uh, Joe Warzel out on scene and find out what he really had. I said I saw a large structure which uh, perhaps might have been a diving plane on the, uh, of the ship or something of that nature. And one additional picture that appeared to be a rather large hole in the craft with a... Uh, He's a pretty reputable guy, and we all believed in him. That was good enough for us, and we didn't ask him, however, shall we tell the press? It was with considerable consternation that I heard on the radio the next day all, all the details, and in fact, even elaboration of the few comments I had made. So on, on uh, Friday, Warzel and Conrad were returning to port, and that the Navy would pick up the photos, and they would be sent down to the appropriate laboratories to be analyzed. When the pictures reached the Naval Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, the joking analysis was that instead of a picture of Thresher, Conrad had photographed the trigger weight of its own camera. The initial look at the photography uh, was taken out there, but, uh, should have been, because if they found something in an the area, they could stay in the area and, sh and uh, photograph it again. But uh, sometimes uh, even news releases were made of photography before we would actually receive it here. And that's what happened uh, in this case of the uh, trigger weight. And what did the newspaper call that, Phil? The first word we heard on this was part of the uh, stabilizer fin on the uh, submarine. Well, it does look like a fin. Yes, it does. Admittedly, it certainly does look like a fin. This is another example of uh, misidentification. It came at the same time as the little lead weight. This, I believe, was identified as part of the uh, whole superstructure. Actually, if we found that it was a flaw in the film, and uh, some of the round-shaped objects that you see in there are actually uh, emulsion blisters. Now it is June. The tragedy of pressure, constantly plagued by frustration, now compounded by the picture fiasco, has turned to public humiliation. Public interest in the search wanes. News coverage all but vanishes. There was some talk of calling off the search.
But Captain Andrews, his submariners, and the entire underwater scientific community were convinced Thrusher had to be found. Hopes for Pine Rusher now hang on being able to pinpoint an area small enough to merit sending the Trieste down. All through June, Trieste continued to wait in Boston Harbor. Because she covers the ocean floor at a speed of only one knot, has only limited light, and can stay... On June 25th, Joe Warzel and his Conrad crew dropped the magnometer on the 1,000 feet of cable, hoping for a signal that would indicate a large metal lot. We got the signature on the magnetometer, and it took us two days to get back over the same spot. The current was so bad. We had done this a second time and a, even a third time. We then put the camera down. There were a number of pictures of debris. This is one of the ones of the larger pieces of debris. Uh, here is the, uh, the large plate of some sort with uh, uh, attached to it uh, various uh, coatings that uh, would have been probably a sound coating. The other one shows a uh, an air flask, I should say, uh, which was uh, part of uh, the, this type of submarine. It weighs about a uh, ton and a half, and it's sticking in the bottom about four feet. And this has been identified by uh, the uh, constructors of the ship uh, on the basis of the fitting on the top of the flat. On the basis of this, it was decided uh, at the uh, meeting with all the people who weighed the evidence uh, to that this was now justification for taking the thresh, uh, the uh, uh, Trieste out to make a dive. Trieste is towed out from Boston and prepared for submerging. Trieste is basically an underwater balloon, constructed to move up and down, with only limited ability to travel laterally. Because of this limitation, Trieste requires a pinpoint search area. Skin divers make final checks on her equipment. A pressure-proof window, cameras, radiation counters, sonar, and a mechanical arm. These pictures of the Trieste being prepared were made during other dives, but the films you are about to see of the ocean bottom were made during the thresher search. Inside Trieste, Commander Donald Keach told us of his seven sweeps on the ocean floor. Then you went to a depth of, what, 8,400 feet? The depth in the general area is about 8,500 feet, and it took us about 45 minutes to an hour to get down to to this depth. But once you're down there, then what do you do in, in searching for debris or the hull? Uh, as we go down in the water column, the Trieste, of course, gets heavier and heavier as the gasoline, our buoyancy material, uh, starts squeezing under this enormous pressure. So we drop ballast, and uh, eventually, by the time we get to the bottom, pro probably drop about three tons of steel ballast. When we get to the bottom, we hover about 20 feet above the bottom, take our bearings, find out what the bottom current is. In that area, it's about one quarter of a knot, and it's uh, variable in direction. We get down there and look around us with uh, sonar acoustically. We look around on TV. We look around through the window. Just take our bearings, and then we start searching. And we normally have a laid-out search pattern. We cover quite a bit of territory, but quite slowly. We can only see visually about 60 feet ahead because this is an area of absolute darkness. There is no sunlight penetration. We use some 6,000 watts of light just to produce our 60-foot vision. When you first made an approach to this area where the debris was strewn about, what did the bottom look like there? That's a funny thing. After making several dives with Trieste in this area and uh, not seeing too much, uh, I did on number three dive notice certain things about the bottom. The the animal life, there are a good deal of sea urchins in the area, and they were slightly smaller than those in other areas, and were much more numerous. We could see uh, the uh, pill shark, I think they're called, they're a bottom-dwelling shark with a long, undulating tail and a uh, sharp nose. We could see that type of animal life down there. We could see pieces of, uh, of every type of material that under the sun. Our first indication that we were in the the right spot was uh, on the third dive when uh, Mr. McKenzie, my scientific counterpart, uh, and I made a dive on the 24th of June. We saw a flash of yellow uh, just out of the corner of my eye. We maneuvered close into it and found that it was a, a booty of the type that uh, the nuclear submariners use in going into the uh, reactor compartment, it takes any stray radiation that might possibly be there and 
and this is what we saw and it had an SSN 5 on it. Whatever other numbers it might have had were hidden underneath it because it was folded in two. That was at the very end of uh, dive number three. We'd been down for four hours and our endurance at the bottom with our power is only four hours. So our power was getting very low. Uh, the lights were getting a little bit dim. Uh, the motors we were having trouble cutting in the relays. And uh, it was just at the end that we saw this. So we, uh, we tried to go further and we probably made it another 200 yards after seeing this first sign of pressure. And uh, in fact, as the dive was over, we did see in the distance uh, larger pieces of debris flashing uh, off our lights and uh, paper and real lightweight metal. But there was nothing we could do to pursue it because we just ran out of power and had to surface. We have still pictures of what you and the others saw in the subsequent dive. Could you tell us what these show? Yes, that picture is a picture of the debris in the general area that we were in on the eighth dive, which is uh, it looks like a vast automobile junkyard. The uh, mass of stuff in the lower right-hand corner there is rock wool type insulation used extensively on submarines. Uh, this is uh, part of a, a sonar dome located in the forward superstructure of thresher class submarines. This is a particularly adapted to thresher and it's uh, about 20 feet long, I guess. You could be very close on that. Yes, and yet we were uh, we were at least 18 feet above it because this is where we stayed normally throughout this period. Had we gotten any lower, we would have become entangled with it, and with our thin skin, it could cause serious damage. You mean the thin skin of, of, the... of the Trieste, the uh, the balloon-like structure that holds the gasoline. This is very difficult to see, but uh, it does have numbers on them. I can see a four, three, and a zero there, and there's a two behind each one of those, and it's part of the draft mark on the uh, side plating of the thresher. The whole picture is, is part of the thresher, but the draft marks are in the upper part of it now. This is the part of the section of pipe that we retrieved on dive number eight, and it includes the nomenclature, the 593 boat and job order number, and the part description. Uh, this is part of the air purification system on board Thresher, located in the fan room. We can read that scratching on the pipe very clearly. When and where was that put on? Uh, that put on by a vibrator drill in a shipyard. So there's no doubt whatsoever that that pipe did come off of the Thresher. Right, that, that definitely came off Thresher. And this was located in this same general area. Uh, every square yard had pieces of this or of this type of material on it down there, and I just random, uh, selected this at random. Now, how did you get this piece of pipe back up to the surface? Never before had we gotten any useful work out of our mechanical arm, but on uh, this series of dives, it just didn't perform satisfactorily. In fact, uh, on the dive, when it did its first useful work, uh, the lower part of the arm developed arthritis, and we couldn't do anything with it so that uh, we actually had to pick the large piece of pipe up by the elbow. And we picked it up in the elbow and forced it up against the underside of Trieste itself, and it teetered all the way back to the surface again. That is, you had to grab it in the elbow in of the, the mechanical arm. That's right, in the crook of the elbow. Uh, we used Those motors were the only ones that were still working by the time we got to 8,500 feet. The so-called hands and fingers of the arm just wouldn't function. No, they just froze in place. What are some of the things you learned from the entire pressure search experience? The thing we learned that's most important is that we know so little about the deep ocean. We know far less about it than we know about the near side of the moon. And yet this covers some 70% of the Earth. Uh, we found that we couldn't uh, blithely take uh, surface uh, fathometer records and find out what the bottom looks like. It just doesn't look like that down there. And you have to get down there and look at it to see that, uh, that the bottom is entirely different than the records that's taken from the surface. Micro relief is, uh, is quite large. We find uh, it took us several months to try to find out what the bottom currents were from, from surface ships. Uh, and yet on the first dive, uh, Trieste or a machine like Trieste can go down and very accurately measure the current. So these, uh, these are things that only this type of vehicle can do, and it, and it does them well, and uh, it certainly should be and will be used much more extensively in the future. While the probe a mile and a half beneath the surface of the sea continued, 
the probe at Portsmouth worked its way through 120 witnesses, filling 12 volumes with diagrams, blueprints, schematic drawings, shipyard reports, and of course, whatever information was supplied by Trieste and all the oceanographers. Captain Andrews. There's no doubt in my mind that we have, uh, that we're within maybe 100 or 150 yards of where the actual hull is, and that what we have found are pieces which were knocked off as the ship passed through crushed up and fell slightly to the east, west, to the north, to the south of where the actual major hull will be. So I think that what we have seen is certainly within maybe maximum 100 to 150 yards of where the actual hull is. I think that uh, the pressure hull should be found in the first series of five dives that are made this coming year. Trieste's search for pressure stopped just short of its goal because winter weather and heavy seas made operations impossible. Trieste has been redesigned and refitted for the final stages of its exploration and is expected to begin this spring at the site of the marker buoy. When pressure is found, closer inspection of her hull might enable the court of inquiry to verify its findings. President of the court, Admiral Bernard Austin. The court found that most likely, very likely, the cause of the loss of the pressure was a piping failure, most likely in the engine room. And at the great depth at which the submarine was operating, this failure caused uh, high velocity spray, which uh, would have damaged electrical switchboards and equipment, causing a loss of power. Thresher was built at Portsmouth Naval Shipyards. Just prior to her fatal dive, she had been overhauled and inspected there. We asked Shipyard Commander Admiral Charles Palmer about the probable piping failure. We're talking about a saltwater pipe uh, which carries, uh, for example, cooling water uh, for the condensers, the steam, steam condensers, and also, of course, uh, pipes which uh, uh, permit us to trim the ship and adjust the ballast. We have uh, over uh, 60,000 joints in our piping systems in a submarine. Over 20,000 of these we consider to be critical, and they will <coughs> receive some type of uh, non-destructive testing, uh, such again as radiography, ultrasonics, and, and so on. And each one of these joints, some 20,000 of them, is pedigree. How can these pipes break if they've been put to all of these tests? One uh, might be a fatigue failure from uh, vibration. This is a possibility. We wouldn't expect it, but uh, this is one possibility. Six months prior to the Thresher loss, Vice Admiral Hyman Rickover, father of our nuclear Navy, in a speech before the National Metal Congress and later repeated before a congressional committee, warned, and we quote, there has been more than one time I have been on a submarine where the failure of material due to poor workmanship could have lost the ship if someone had not been alert. End of quote. We asked Admiral Palmer if he had any such experiences. No, I don't recall of any case uh, of that kind. There have been isolated, uh, isolated cases, yes. Again, I, I want to emphasize that the uh, state of the art always progresses, and we're confident that, uh, that uh, this type of thing uh, uh, will not happen, at least in, uh, in systems which uh, might prove catastrophic if failure occurred. I think what uh, Admiral Rickover and some of the others were driving at was that, in their opinion, which is not the Navy's opinion, that there's a real problem of quality control with people who supply the parts for submarines. It's not a major problem. It is a problem. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> uh, I believe I mentioned uh, before, uh, during the uh, fiscal year, which ended last uh, July, we rejected, uh, upon receipt, uh, some 27% of all the piping materials which we received from vendors. The Court of Inquiry also had some recommendations on inspection, testing, and procedures. We found that there were some operating procedures which uh, needed to be changed. We found that there were some uh, inspection procedures that needed to be 
followed more diligently, we found that there were certain uh, processes that needed uh, to be changed and certain design characteristics that needed to be looked into. In submarine construction, as well as sophisticated missile systems, in any area of defense where precision manufacturing is vital, quality control is a constant hazard. We ask the head of the Atlantic Submarine Fleet, Vice Admiral Elton Grenfell, about such criticism. Uh, oh, I don't think that it's fair to say that we're slipshod in, in, our, in our engineering practices. Uh, uh, I rather like to pay tribute to our industrial and scientific effort in this country. Uh, we're a great nation. Uh, there are times when we may manufacture things in haste. Our quality control isn't quite what it should be. Uh, but generally speaking, I think the quality control of our equipment and our systems and our submarines has been excellent. Although all of the evidence and most of the findings of the report remain secret, it is known that the tone and meaning of the verdict is stern. And to quote a member of the court, points a finger. It does not say in so many words that faulty workmanship or incomplete testing caused the disaster, but it directs in precise terms that quality control and testing of pipes, welded and brazed joints and plates be intensely improved. But perhaps the most disturbing aspect of the search has been the low state of the art of deep water investigations. At a time when more than 30 to 40 nuclear submarines range the seven seas with hundreds of men underwater at all times, our nation's oceanographic knowledge and capability remain virtually what they were in the days of the old diesel fleet. The haunting thought throughout the search for Thresher was that even if the hull had been 1,000 feet down, with all hands still alive, nothing could have been done. Admiral Edward Steffen, who since Thresher has headed the Navy's Deep Water Submergence Review Group. When the Thresher was lost, uh, there was no rescue problem because of the depth at which she was lost. But we felt that she could have been lost at a point where there was rescue uh, problem, and we wouldn't have been able to respond to it. You simply cannot design a rescue system and hope for it to be effective if it's only going to be used as infrequently as we've had submarine disasters in the past, and hopefully it'll be more infrequent in the future. That if you build a system that simply sits around for years and years waiting for the next submarine disaster, it probably won't work when the time comes. We're recommending a program that will include one group of vehicles to go to a depth that will take care of current submarine capabilities for, and areas where there could be a rescue uh, requirement. And we'll be able to do it under any weather conditions. And when they're not employed, as we hopefully they won't be in rescue operations, these vehicles can be used for many other uh, work and operations. What do you consider the legacy of the Thresher? Well, as a submariner, it is certainly my hope that the people who lost their lives in the Thresher will not have died in vain. That as a result of the attention they brought to this program, this country will develop tremendous capability to go to exploit the ocean in its full depth and to do useful work on the ocean floor. Although Thresher has dramatized the vital need to know more of the depths, the oceanographers, perhaps the least glamorous of all the scientists, had been pointing to the need for a hundred other basic reasons. Dr. Roger Rebell of the Scripps Institute. Yes, I think that, that the legacy of the Thresher uh, start, must, must start somehow like this, that the Thresher was operating at the very limit of human capability and she came to a, to a tragic end. Uh, after, she, after she was lost, we realized for the first time how little ability we had to operate in deep water. The problem of deep submergence was, was, was something, uh, not just simply going down there, but being able to do something after you're there. The realization hit us like, a stone, like, like, like hitting a stone wall that this was something we couldn't do. So the second legacy from the Thresher will be this legacy of, of driving us and spurring us to learn how to operate effectively to do things at great depths. Now, this, uh, this, this in turn, I think, will lead to, to 
many things that we can't even dream of today. Uh, uh, the everything we find out about being able to operate in this way and at the and, and, and under these extraordinarily difficult conditions will, will help us to, to understand and to be familiar with the ocean and, to, and to therefore to use it for human welfare and for human knowledge and understanding. Watching this 1960 film of Thrusher coming down the ways after its launching, one is again reminded what a special kind of community a nuclear submarine is. Admiral Rickover, borrowing from Admiral Horatio Nelson, called it not a team, but a band of brothers. The wife of Thrusher's captain, Mrs. Wes Harvey, recently said, our men have been lost performing the duty they freely chose in the service of their country. She not only spoke for the 129 men of Thrusher and their families, but for their brothers in other submarines. Perhaps the most lasting tribute to Thrusher and to those who have meticulously pursued the mystery of her tragedy is that re-enlistments in the submarine force have never wavered not the day after Thrusher sank, or 11 months later. Vice Admiral Elton Grenfell, in whose Atlantic command Thrusher belonged. These tragedies make us realize that we are in a, in a hazardous business, that we've got to know what we're doing all the time, uh, that we've got to do the job better uh, in all ways, both from an operational viewpoint, from a material viewpoint, and that uh, uh, contrary to any letdown in the, in the morale of our people, I think it, it built up a great morale. The response that our submarine boys uh, came through in supporting the Thrusher dependents, for example, and uh, trying to do a better job was, was wonderful. We've, uh, we've had uh, terrific reenlistment rates, which is indicative that, they, that these boys considered that this is a tragedy that is unusual, uh, not a daily occurrence, and uh, that uh, these wonderful boys in the Thresher uh, really gave us something to shoot for, to improve ourselves in every way possible. And this is what they're doing today. O oh God, thy sea is so great, and my boat is so small. This is Dan Rather, CBS Report. reports the legacy of the thresher was filled and edited by the staff of cbs reports under the supervision and control of cbs news <laughs>